I'm going to talk about money because we are the business network. And oh, the I'll take sort of over stuff. from here, Nate. You can bounce. <laughs> take, take a coffee break, Nate. And by coffee break, I mean bring me my coffee. Without trash talk, this sport is nothing, some would say. You know I would absolutely kill you if you ever did something like that, you right? Can- Words like venom upon a blade. You ain't no man, you took welfare. Trash talk is the game athletes play to draw eyes, to garner fame, to humiliate. All right, man, I'm done talking to you. You can't be done talking to me. You're right here facing me, <laughs> dummy. But what happens when it goes wrong? What happens when words cannot be rescinded? This video will explore the dark recesses of fighters' careers, a completion in cinematic form of those who have been humbled, humiliated, and fallen short of their manifestations. Uh, I'm not the Homer Simpson of, box, of MMA like you are, bro. I'm not going to take a beating, but you will get knocked the fuck out. And where best to start than Connor's proper 12 and cocaine infused fever dream that was his return from boxing? He's going to jail. He's going to jail. Former UFC champion Conor McGregor is due to appear in Brooklyn Criminal Court. He's been charged with assault, reckless endangerment, and criminal mischief for the April incident. I just want to say I'm thankful to the DA and the judge for allowing me to move forward. Send a message like location, location, I'm gonna come. Here's my location, you little fool, right in front of you. Do something about it. Do something about it. Yeah, you'll do nothing. It's shooting the bush's birthday. Okay, you, you guys have your own you, language. Let's wrestle, kid. Let's, let's wrestle. wrestle. Let's wrestle. Let's wrestle. wrestle. It's gonna be a long night. Yes. He oh, knows Lord, this. show me that. He knows this. You're a fake lying rat. A fake lying. I'm real. I wear it on my chest. There's a gorilla on my chest. I wear it proud me. Ali Abdul Aziz. Ali. 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 Yeah, Ali. I know a lot about here. you as well, you mad rat. I know a lot about you as well. How's Noah? How's Noah? Huh? Yeah. Shut your mouth. Fuck peace. There will never be peace here. I always say you should aim for peace, but if you can't aim for peace, aim between the eyes. After a heated face-off, the culmination of a year's worth of vitriol between the competitors was about to come to head on the biggest fight stage the MMA world had ever seen. From taking shots at religion, to calling Ali Abdelaziz a terrorist, Conor McGregor's intoxicated ramble of shit-laced trash talk was a spectacle to behold. Whilst it did spawn a plethora of sound bites and memes, the thing of note was that the Conor that had returned to MMA was different somehow. That slick and quotable man that had defined the previous era of the UFC with his silver tongue and that had welcomed more fans to the sport than can ever be appreciated was gone, replaced with a twitchy, uninspired drunk, a proper 12 salesman that rambled like your pervy uncle. The matchup for McGregor went about as well as you could imagine. Khabib did what Khabib does, dragged McGregor to the ground and smashed him. The brawl afterwards just served as a reminder that sometimes promotion of a fight seeps into the real world with very real emotional damage. It's a black spot in this sport's history, and it goes without saying that Connor had separated himself from a lot of fans during the whole charade. The spectacle serves as a reminder that trash talk truly can go wrong, and that words can be taken too far. Being humbled on that big of a stage is probably something most wouldn't ever let down. But after a lobotomy, courtesy of Dustin at UFC 257, McGregor has most likely forgotten this less than ideal moment in time. But we all remember, because that's what happens when trash talk goes wrong. You become immortalized for all the wrong reasons. And so now it's time to explore the history of trash talk in depth. So sit back and relax and enjoy this feature length version of when trash talk goes wrong. Back in 2010, the sport had managed to firmly cement its place in the mainstream, growing year on year and leaving the controversy and naysayers in the rearview mirror. It was also at this time that Anderson Silva, a man fit for MMA's Mount Rushmore, was experiencing his career high point. He had swung into the UFC and managed to single-handedly clear out the middleweight division and also dabble at light heavyweight successfully. It was clear to everyone that Silva didn't really have anyone that could challenge his seat upon the throne, which leads us swiftly to the 
next potential victim of the spider that was lurking in the shadows. I honestly think that it would be impossible in our adventure down the road of trash talk going wrong without stopping off at the American gangster himself. For filthy casuals, Conor McGregor is the epitome of trash talk, but for those who have enjoyed the finer aspects of this sport for years, it is indeed Chael Sonnen who is synonymous with talking trash. Chael wasn't your average American. He had grown up on the rough streets of West Lynn, Oregon. And I've seen things and been through things that somebody like you in your little pearly loft couldn't even relate to. You haven't seen the things I've seen. You haven't been down that way. You haven't been to the mean streets of Westland, Oregon. This volatile upbringing cut Chael from granite. He was tough, grizzled, and this manifested in his fighting style. A man who would drag you down into his own personal hell and ground and pound his opponents either into submission or take them to gruelling decisions. Each thudding shot on the ground, an echo from that tumultuous childhood. When it came to Anderson, Chael had some choice words and his marketing for the matchup was signature Chael. Sonnen was a god in the eyes of the fans. He had built an entire empire off of his personality a sarcastic, witty, and truly talented wordsmith. And after a noteworthy win streak, Anderson was now in his playground. There's this dirtbag named Anderson Silva. We don't have to fight. I issued him in writing. I sent it over my demands. <laughs> he leave the UFC for no less than 12 months. He issued an apology to the fans. Simple things. And he erected a statue in my likeness in his living room that he bowed to each evening. He didn't accept them. If we walk in the back dressing room and Anderson says put on hip hop and Chael walks in and says put on country, I guarantee it's going to be a hoedown. I've been nothing but a gentleman to Anderson Silva. I offered him a way out. That treaty needed to be signed and, and faxed back to me on Sunday. He missed it by three days. Now we're going to go to war. His running is done. His 15 minutes are famer up. People tell me he's a great fighter. I say, really? When did you see him fight? because I haven't seen him fight. Well, Anderson's a fraud. He's a liar and he's a thief. I stand here on my own free will. I stand here because I beat every middleweight they got in my way. Anderson's here because Dana White's making him. Nobody cares about Anderson Silva. Nobody buys his merchandise. He's the worst selling pay-per-view draw in the history of the UFC championship division. Who cares how he leaves? Just go. He's been threatening to go for a long time. Nobody cares. He doesn't talk to the fans. He doesn't talk to the media. He pretends he doesn't speak English. We're ready to see him leave. He's a nuisance. He's annoying and he doesn't have any fans. I've heard of you. Now I thought I didn't know I'd ever meet you, but ladies and gentlemen, this is Anderson Silva's fan. I heard that he had one. Anderson Silva is easily the most unpopular fighter in this company. I'm the one they're tuning in to see. I'm the one that's selling out the arena, not him. When Anderson Silva walks into a room, you could hear a rat piss on cotton. I don't want to fight Anderson. I want to beat him down. I'm going to put him on his prissy little ass. This guy not from a bowing culture. You bow in Brazil, they'll hit you over the head and take your wallet out of your pocket. He beat up a math teacher. He beat up a slow and unathletic light heavyweight, a couple of them. I beat every champion there's ever been except one. This isn't a fight that's going to be tit for tat. This isn't a war. We're not going to go out and battle each other. This is going to be a one-sided pounding and I'm swinging the hammer. I'm not in here to get the silver medal or say I one time fought in the main event in the UFC. I'm here purely to win the world championship period and it doesn't have a lot to do with Anderson. Getting to beat up Anderson is just a bonus. On August 7th, 2010, Chael would put all the shit talking to the test, facing across from the fearsome legend himself. Within two minutes, public perception of how the fight was meant to play out had completely shattered. Not only had the American gangster hit Anderson with some heavy shots that buckled the Brazilian, oh, he he rocked him. He but Chael had managed to get the fight to the floor and start what would be another five rounds of pure and violent beatdown. Anderson would be brutalized for 25 minutes. Manifest Destiny played out in all its patriotic beauty upon the canvas. Multiple 10-8 rounds on multiple judges' scorecards. And just like that, a true legend and a man who was seemingly unbeatable was taken out in the UFC for the first time by a man who had suffered on the cruel and wicked streets of West Lynn. God, I'd give up my life to win that championship if I had to. 
after completely dominating the fight for 23 minutes and 10 seconds, Anderson Silva, the spider, would spin a web out of desperation, and in some miraculous display of determination, he would choke the American unconscious. I, I love the fact that, that Chael went out and talked the smack that he did, and, and, and the, you know, the, the way that he talked about this fight, and then went out and backed it up. It's devastating. I, I just, I can't sugarcoat it. My heart's broken. I, uh... I came in with a silver medal. I, I wrestled for a world championship. I came in second. I fought in the WEC for a world championship. I came in second. Now I fought in the UFC. And again, I'm a runner-up, and it hurts really bad. But look, he's a good fighter, and he found a way to win, and that's what champions do. Just a few months later, Chael would pop for steroids and be banned from the sport for a year. I don't know if anybody's failed more drug tests than me, but the other side of it is I don't know if anybody's gotten away with more drugs than me, right? I mean, they, they got me over like seven substances, but I was on at least 17, like... After licking his wounds, he would come back and submit top contender Brian Stan. And well, Chael hadn't changed one bit and still had one man on his mind. Anderson Silva, you absolutely suck! Super Bowl weekend, the biggest rematch in the history of the business. I'm calling you out, Silva, but we're up in the stakes. I beat you. You leave the division. You beat me. I will leave the UFC forever. And that was the thing. Chael Sonnen did what Chael Sonnen does. And no loss was about to make him eat his words or make him apologize for the way that he marketed his fights. That's why the promotion loves him. And that's why the fans adore him. Chael would ultimately lose the second fight with Silver in the first round. And many people would point to both of these losses that had been propped up by countless hours of Chael belittling the Brazilian as a fine example of when trash talk goes wrong. But in reality, all that controversial trash talk had gotten him to that position in the first place. Whether it was main events or championship opportunities, Chael's big mouth backed up with gutsy performances was a combination that the UFC brass couldn't say no to. Yes, Chael said a lot of shit and lost against Silver twice, but you simply can't humble a man who doesn't care and refuses to apologize. You cannot humiliate the undefeated and the undisputed people's champ of the world. Trash talk doesn't always go wrong, but I'll tell you something that is always wrong, me. Which is why I'm giving you the Fade Academic Special, brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, who are kind enough to sponsor this video. Making the right picks can be difficult. That's why I want to tell you the easiest way to get in on some action for the MMA events coming up. It's Underdog Fantasy and their Pick'em game. Just pick higher or lower on your favorite or least favorite fighter's stats, and you can win up to 20 times your money back in a single night. Or just pick the opposite of whoever I've gone with, because I can never get a prediction right. Underdog makes everything super smooth with their easy to use app. Pick between between two and five fighters to fill out your pick a entry. Get every pick right and you'll be walking away with a skip in your step. So if you want the best way to play fantasy every fight night and you want to directly support the channel, use code ACADEMIC and get your deposit doubled up to $100 using the link in the description and that will get you to the right place. Underdog Fantasy is available in many states across the US. Use the map on screen now to see if you're in an eligible area. Thanks again to Underdog Fantasy for making this video possible. So download the Underdog Fantasy app and use code ACADEMIC. Fresh off the thrill of dispatching his former teammate for the second time, leaving Garbrandt to list his chin on Craigslist under spares and repairs, TJ Dillashaw would call out and push for a fight with Henry Cejudo, the newly controversially crowned flyweight champion. Many initially thought that the obvious choice was to see Henry move up a weight class and fight for TJ's crown, but in a surprise to everyone, TJ announced that he was planning on moving down to 125 pounds to challenge for double championship status. There's a possible super fight with you and Henry Cejudo Hell that's yeah. being talked about. Hell yeah. Would would you fight him at 125? 25s. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want no excuses that I'm the bigger man. I want to show that I can make 25s and be the, my best ever as well. You really think you can beat me? Then fuck you, man. Let's do this shit. You know? TJ already looked like he was preparing for the starring role in The Machinist, and so naturally the thought of him cutting even more weight was kind of disturbing. TJ and Henry, ever the PR enthusiast, didn't wait around idly. They got straight to talking trash just 10 days later. They would sit down with TMZ and start trading barbs. I can tell Let me go medalist. I, can I can't wait to take that too. I'll take it off you. <laughs> he hasn't uh, dealt with my movement. He hasn't dealt with me mixing it up. I'm going to knock out Henry Cejudo. I'll take that belt. He's 
been begging me to take that belt off his shoulder. It's too much weight for him. You know, that gold medal's light. <laughs> this UFC belt's got a lot more, lot more weight to it. I'm going to take it right off his shoulder. On November 26th of that year, the UFC announced an eating disorder for TJ, as it was confirmed that he would take on Henry for the flyweight belt at UFC 233. Subsequently, that event would be cancelled so that the pair could fight a week earlier, serving as the main event for the first ever card on ESPN. Henry had somewhat revived hope for the flyweight division when he captured the crown. Dana White had been maliciously hinting at culling the 125 pounders as they didn't exactly move the needle and the division wasn't deep enough to sustain a healthy amount of entertainment and competition. But Henry's ascension to the throne was a light in the darkest hour of the small guys. TJ, in all his strange arrogance, had decided to market his move down a division as his opportunity to put the final nail in the weight class's coffin. Fans and media alike would quickly point out that his friends and training partners were in the division and that he was essentially boasting about making his mates jobless. And he's made comments in the media like saying like he doesn't really care about the future of the flyweight division. It was really, uh, I felt I felt it was disrespectful if you consider people in the division like me and other guys in the division, even guys that got cut, considered his friend. It really makes you question, you know, like, ah, is this guy my friend? Like, why would he say something like that? It was an odd misstep, but it was just the first in what would be a slew of trash talk that he might just later regret. I'm gonna get in there on the 19th. I'm gonna destroy this dork. He's walking around himself, talking about himself in the third person, carrying his belt everywhere. Better start shining up that oh, resume instead of that belt. He's gonna be looking for a new job when I'm done with you. You've got a boring spider on the roster. UC doesn't even want you. UC knows you're boring. This guy Holy thinks he's a big shot. He won one big fight and he thinks he's a big shot all of a sudden. Hey, you keep talking about making weight. You're the only one that's missed weight. I haven't missed, I've never missed weight since eight years old, ever. I've, I've always been a professional. I've always made weight. I'm gonna make weight easier than you. I'm actually worried that you might miss weight. Great yesterday, open workouts, felt fast, felt strong. Feel great now, I'm ready. You're, you, they offered you a fight at 135, you little bitch, but you wouldn't accept it. So I'm the one coming down to fight. No, no, him. because they want to get. The, they, no, <laughs> I don't think you've ever given anybody a black guy. You're, you're the boringest <laughs> fighter on the road. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not doing it just for me, man. I'm doing it for everybody. I'm doing it for all the 125. And that's your problem. You know. I'm doing this for myself. This is a selfish sport. I'm going out there and I'm winning for myself. I'm gonna be the greatest. And that and, and that's exactly and that's exactly who he is. And that's exactly who he is. You have friends like Joe Benavides. You have you have guys like Shorty Tories living with. These are all flyweights, bro. Where's your respect, man? Never you will never be a real like champion because you're never gonna defend I'm gonna the belt. You're not a champion until you defend it. Just like I did with uh, Garbrandt. Never gonna be a champion. Take a look. <laughs> all right, Conan is big. It's not about the belt, man. It's about the legacy. Being the best ever. TJ Dillashaw would be knocked out in 30 seconds, but he would get the chance for redemption in the locker room, TKOing a plastic table in frustration. Henry Cejudo had done something that many people at this point in his career thought was impossible, and that was to be entertaining. He finally managed to get something on his highlight reel also, and he used the post-fight interview to generate a lot of hype for his next matchup, calling to move up and rematch TJ for his belt this time. TJ on the other hand would only make matters worse for himself. Not only had his trash talk set him up for a big fall, but he would then protest the stoppage, whinging about it, and then subsequently crying at the post-fight press conference. And you're gonna stop the fight like that? I'm in on a single leg. He says, hey, show me something. I said, I'm okay. I'm on a single leg in a scramble, he stops punching, he's defending a single leg and you're gonna stop the fight? That's complete bullshit. If I worked my ass off, bro, I put in a lot of work. I'm about to fucking cry. Then, just two months later, it was revealed that he had failed a drugs test for both pre- and post-competition. It was considered one of the most controversial moments in the sport. All the time, TJ was boasting about setting records in power and fitness during his weight cut were words that would come back around to haunt him. I'm stronger than I was in my last camp. That's no joke. I put up new PRs in my, my snatch, put new PRs in my clean and press. So I'm powerful, I'm explosive. You know, I'm setting new lactate threshold uh, levels on the bike. Uh, I'm holding on to everything, man. I feel great now. I mean, I feel good at, I mean, I feel awesome at 35s. I feel good at 25s. I don't think it really matters what weight I go. 
It's more about your belief and getting out there, you know? TJ had cheated, lied, and relished the fact that he was ending a division where his teammates were active, and just like a poorly made IED, it had all exploded rightfully in his face. It was an embarrassing time in his career, and when it comes to trash talk going awry, I think that this one will always be on top of people's lists. For many, TJ was always extremely arrogant and unlikable, and so this series of events was well deserved. For whatever reason, I always liked TJ, and still do. He didn't make me angry, he just disappointed me. TJ had managed to taint his legacy and embarrass himself all in one fight, and I doubt the fans will ever let him forget it. On the same card that TJ was tragically embarrassed and subsequently disgraced, I'm about to fucking cry. Another event of trash talk going wrong had already unfolded in the headliner of the prelims. UFC veteran and now Hall of Famer Donald Cowboy Cerrone was taking on a surging contender who had impressed the masses in his most recent outings. Alexander Hernandez was running an eight fight winning streak, two of which were in the UFC. His debut was as spectacular as they get, a brutal and flashy knockout of lightweight top contender Benil Dariush. He had taken the fight on on short notice and nonchalantly walked into the bright lights of the UFC octagon. Calm and collected, he then went on to stun the audience with a 42 second knockout. To say his confidence would have been catapulted into the stratosphere is an understatement, especially only the fighter at the age of 25. This was compounded with a win over a now PFL champ Oba Mercier a few months later. The matchup against Donald Cerrone, who was making a return to lightweight after an on and off run at welterweight, was Alex's first chance provided by the UFC to showcase his personality to a live crowd during a a press conference. And well, the young testosterone infused lad didn't hold back when trying to hype up his new position in the organization. First, grateful to Cowboy for taking the fight, maybe against his better judgment. It's just another day and, and to me, standing across from Cowboy, I'm looking, I'm looking through the fighter, I'm looking at the man and I just see myself facing an insecure little lad swinging on a saddle with a pop gun and a feather in his hat. I'll tell you this, little friend, I'll be sending your geriatric ass fucking yeehawing back to the stables on Saturday. Your 40th fight, if it took you that long to figure out what your goals are and that you're meant to be a champion, you're about 39 too fucking late. I'm 100% committed to one thing. I'm like old day drinking Don over there who's got mixed mistresses and a number of extracurricular activities to hide from the greatest fear in his life, which is in front of him. He's number two, he's always been number two. I'm gonna be number one. I won't respect the air he's breathing and I'm gonna press and break him in the octagon. It's a completely different world now. Everything's changed. And yeah, I'd be thinking, who the fuck is this kid too? I'm sure everybody's asking that, who the fuck am I? And on Saturday, I'll put all that curiosity to rest. I think what surprised a lot of people was how Alexander targeted Cerrone with such vehemence straight out of the gate. It was kind of weird considering Cerrone had rarely been on the wrong side of anyone, and more than likely, Alex looked up to the man. Hernandez had other plans though, and at the forefront was putting his name in the mouth of everyone watching by attempting to belittle Cerrone. And in order for this all to pay off was a short walk to the cage. Needless to say, the tough and grizzled vet, back in his home territory of lightweight, single-handedly dismantled the young buck. The fight was an absolute barn burner. Cerrone seemed particularly focused and violent, almost as if someone had pissed him off. Cowboy would push the pace in the second round, finalizing it in a highlight head kick and punches combo, resulting in dual bonuses for Cerrone, performance of the night and fight of the night respectively. The fight is an absolute treat to watch, and whilst Hernandez had kind of won me over with his previous performances, and even with the disrespect towards Cowboy and the build-up, Cerrone always has a dear place in my heart, and it was kind of nice to see him make someone eat humble pie. Joanny Uncechek had risen to UFC champion back in 2015, and within two years had managed to notch five title defences into her 12 pounds of gold and leather. She had quickly become a fan favourite, a technical striker, and dominant in all her outings, a skill set that she had perfected from her long and storied career as a world champion Muay Thai specialist. It was announced that Joanna would be taking on Rose Namajunez at Madison Square Garden in November of 2017. Joanna had centrally called her entire division, and to give you an idea of the type of challenges that were coming through, Rose had earned 
her shot at gold with a win streak literally one deep, completely at odds with the rest of the sport where people like Tony Ferguson had to go 11 fights. Rose was a reserved fighter and never talked bad about opponents and was always super respectful in fights. She had fought for the inaugural strawweight title but came up short against Carla Esparza. She had done well thus far but nothing compared to Joanna and so she opened up unsurprisingly as a plus 500 underdog. Joanna was expected to rip her face off just for the thrill and the discussion around her and her utter domination up until this point gave her a well-deserved air of invincibility. I don't know if something was in the air or that the success had gone to her head but Joanna would go into fight week with a rather strange, rather different approach. And well, you know the score by now. There is only one strawy queen of the world and it's me, Joanna, the champion. Oh, shit about being a champion and you're never gonna be a champion. I have no chance. For the first time I have a son like him. I'm taking a soul with me. Her fiance, he's a big pussy. He said to my team members that there are bitches. You don't do this and you don't play with me. Because you don't wanna to meet a boogie woman in this fight. You will respect me more than you can even fucking imagine. You keep talking or what are you saying to her? I'm just saying the Lord's Prayer. Boogie woman is coming for you! The boogie woman, ladies and gentlemen! It was like the devil and a mm -hmm. priest. It was like the two of you together. It was like yeah, you, were, you were doing like an exorcist. <laughs> right. And she was like saying she was the boogie woman. But it was one yeah. of my favorite stare downs and the, mm -hmm. the, just the build up. Joanna and Rose would stare deep into each other's souls inside the cage in what is perhaps one of the coldest face offs in the sport's long history. Like, just to break up the idea that she could be that comfortable in a kickboxing situation. Joanna would say that the boogie woman was coming, but the only thing that she had coming her way was a feature on this video. After reciting the Lord's Prayer in defense against Joanna's dark energy, Rose would proceed to baptize the dominant and undefeated champion, accompanied by the now famous mantra of Thug Rose, courtesy of Daniel Cormier, who in stunned disbelief at what he had just witnessed would relapse into screaming the CTE Winter Soldier activation words. <laughs> And I guess that was the thing. Absolutely no one expected Rose to win. She wasn't given a chance. And to go on to dismantle the champion in such a perfect, controlled and skilled manner was truly unbelievable to witness. Rose's composure carried her through the pre-fight shenanigans. And then, just like the female Agent 47 that she embodies, would use that controlled sensibility to snipe Joanna's head clean off her shoulders, sending her on an unplanned vacation to the Shadow Realm. The fight would skyrocket Rose into the mainstream, and many considered the whole spectacle to be one of the greatest moments the sport had ever seen. Joanna had looked unstoppable in her run up until this point and had already cemented her place in female martial arts history. Her uncharacteristic turn to heel was strange to see and unfortunately for her, she was made to swallow every single word. It was a shame really because Joanna was very likeable and so that personality change rubbed many people up the wrong way, especially considering that Rose was just a quiet, shy girl. Justin Gaethje was one of the most hyped promotional newcomers upon his debut, entering the UFC after going 17-0, an undefeated minor organization champion over in the World Series of Fighting. The fact that his debut was a main event against Michael Johnson really sums up what fans thought of him and also what the UFC expected out of him. He was a violent man who never backed down and kept walking forward no matter what. His fight with Johnson lived up to that. The fight was a back and forth barn burner, performance of the night worthy, fight of the night worthy, and also fight of the year 2017. No amount of words can sum up how enthralling that competition was. Gaethje living up to the hype and living by the notoriety that he had earned up until that point, weathering the storm and coming out on top, a durable and devastating man in equal measure. The bout after this, Eddie Alvarez and himself would duke it out for the title of the very fitting, most violent fighter moniker. Whilst it didn't exactly go Justin Gaethje's way, 
he certainly proved that he was the second most violent man in the UFC, backed up by another war with Dustin Poirier just four months later. Unfortunately, Justin would suffer another loss. There was a fair amount of criticism levelled at Gaethje for the way that he went to war in his fights. No UFC fighter can get by by just having a chin of granite, and whilst it may have allowed him to rise to a wondrous, undefeated 18-0 against lesser competition, those sharks in the top echelon of the division were as equally durable, but fought far more technical for the most part. Gaethje said that he was here for a good time and not a long time, and seemed quite content with becoming best friends with CTE. That philosophy might be great for fans who just want to see blood spilled onto the canvas, but it doesn't exactly buy into a career full of wins. Gaethje was provided a chance to bounce back from his losses by taking on surging contender James Vick. Vick was a rangy sniper, who liked to stay on the outside and use his length to his advantage, putting to use his rather unique lightweight frame, standing at 6 foot 3. Vick had only fallen short once in his career, a knockout loss to Benil, and his matchup with Gaethje was his first time in a main event, and it signified the start of his potential time at the top of the lightweight division. Considering the opportunity, he had one goal in mind sell his name, and smelling the blood in the waters of a twice knocked out Gaethje, Vick would head into the press conference rather boisterous. And I wanted to ask Justin as well, I mean, uh, you know, James has been in the media, he's been talking a little bit, but I wonder if this is getting a little bit personal for you. You're welcome, James. Welcome to the big show. You uh, get to fight the main event. You made it, buddy. Yeah, thank you, man. It's your last main event. You're about to be uh, on a three-fight losing streak and, and shipping your ass back to the b League to fight tomato cans again. And I'll still have more money in my bank account. I got more money than you right now, bro. I, I fought four times in the last year, and I won my fights. You, you lost two out of three. You fucking suck, dude. I've bro, made more money in bonuses. You're a, you're a can you crusher. You're a can career. crusher, bro. You padded your record against B-level competition. I made two hundred thousand dollars in bonuses. You, you've been fucking. Congratulations. You haven't made that in your ten fights. Congratulations. Don't break your hand patting yourself on the ass, bro. Uh, in my mind, I'm a future world champion, and this is one of many main events for me. And after this, I, I got a, a couple people in mind. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait until after August 25th. I, I'm, I'm gonna get on the mic and I'm gonna talk some shit and call some people out. James, are you gonna run like a bitch the whole time, or are you gonna stand there and fight me for these people? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not the Homer Simpson of, bar, of MMA like you are, bro. I'm not gonna take a beating, but you will get knocked the fuck out. You take, you take ten significant strikes per minute. That's fifty shots a round that you're. You ain't lasting. You ain't lasting three rounds of me taking all that beating like that. You're so twenty nine years yes old and you're not. You're twenty nine years old and you're punch drunk and, and, and slurring when you talk, bro. So um, I yeah, you're getting knocked out. No, I'm not gonna stand like a retard and, and, and fight. And fight the so you're gonna run like a bitch. But you are gonna get know. slept. You're gonna get knocked out within three rounds. For sure. Pinnacle Bank Arena here in the great city and state of Lincoln, Nebraska. You have to admit that Vic was being quite funny. The problem was that Gaethje was a fan favourite, so James's trash talk just served to backfire, getting roasted in the comment section, many of whom mystic macked their prediction of an obligatory comeuppance post-viral trash talk. And, well, they weren't very far from the truth. The pugilist inside of Gaethje that had seen him rise undefeated into the UFC, and the same one that had seen him fumble to the more technical brawlers, was clearly at odds with Trevor Whitman, who more than likely sat down in front of Justin with that big old grin and said, Brother, you have to win some fucking fights. Whatever Whitman-induced epiphany he had, something seemed to have clicked inside of Gaethje's permanently hemorrhaging brain, and the one that stepped inside of the octagon sent Vic back to AR-15 in Rodeo Disney World, concussed and wholly embarrassed. You know, I remember I had a towel over my head and I was crying and I mean, honestly, it's been depressing, man. This well-coached and calmed highlight reel was the homecoming of a new mythical fighter, Patient Gaethje, a man who would go on to devastate the lightweight division for the next few years to come. The saga between Vic and Gaethje is one of my favourite examples of trash talk going wrong, and it was right around the time that this sport really sank its hook into me. I'd become a casual watcher of the sport for a few years by this point, but Gaethje's introduction into the sport serves as some beautiful nostalgia for me. Gaethje would go on to earn himself a BMF title, and an interim world championship at lightweight, James Vick's chin would never be the same again. 
Dominic Cruz had spent the best part of his career shutting down Team Alpha Male members, and all along the way he would rake them across the coals with his cocky, intelligent and perceptive trash talk. His career, however, had been marred by injury after injury, setback after setback, a legacy of pain outside the Octagon's interlinked chain, a story that I have told previously. After a miraculous return to the sport that saw him take out the champion that had stood in his place, TJ Dillashaw, he would make a quick turnaround and finalise his rivalry with Team Alpha Male owner Uriah Faber. The UFC, seeking to capitalise on the story between Cruz and his rival Jim, would set up a fight with the ever-marketable and violent KO artist Cody Garbrandt, a man who was touted as Faber's very own prodigy. Garbrandt had been making waves on his ascension up the rankings, and all along the way had been trying to goad Cruz into a fight. Well, he almost already had a fight against the champion here about a two hours or so before his fight tonight. Just for, the, for those who did not see our pre-fight show, explain what happened earlier tonight with you and Cody? I mean, it wasn't anything crazy. It was just an exchange of words and understanding and looking at each other in the eye and understanding we're going to see each other very soon, my friend. And, you know, DC got in there and felt us out and said, yeah, maybe I should separate you guys. I don't need you guys hitting each other on this concrete. But uh, it pretty much came down to, you know, I didn't like what you said, to, said about me on some of these interviews, Dom. Um, it hurt my feelings, basically, is the way he said it to me. He didn't say those exact words, but he might as well have. It was in his eyes. They were getting teary and stuff. Cruz saw the young fighter as an unworthy opponent, a man who had been thrusted onto the main stage as the product of circumstance, and he did not shy away from the fact that the fight seemed like a massive mismatch. The trash talk to follow was typical Cruz, just layered with a little more arrogance due to his perceived advantage over the young star. Look, I, I, never put chased, you down I never had a chase pussy in my life on December 30th, I ain't doing it. I don't have to. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? We'll see. So keep your fling on the string, keep your mouth shut, because yeah. this is big boy business. Welcome across there right now, dude. You're a room away. Go ahead, come over here. Yeah. Come on, turd. Let's go. Because he has to be a self-perceived savage. So a savage can't do this, this interview. This is what an alpha, a savage does. He gets mad, he gets angry, and he knocks things out and breaks things and forces things. But with a guy like me, you got to use a different approach, and that's what he's going to find out. targeting Dominic Cruz since he was in high school. I like how he keeps switching stances as well, Mike. Boy, they... Oh! Oh! Goodness! Cruz is back up, at least for now! And new undisputed UFC bantamweight champion of the world! can you do man I mean this is part of it is losing and part of life is losing I think everybody here can say one time or another maybe not in a fight but you felt like a loser and how do you come back from it let's see you know I know myself I've lost before Dominic Cruz had gone just shy of 10 years without tasting defeat inside of the octagon, and to say his reaction to falling foul once more, especially to a man from Team Alpha Male, was anything but humble would be an understatement, and whilst his trash talk had set him up for a fall, he landed with both feet firmly on the ground. Team Alpha Male had finally produced a man to take out Dominic, in what is perhaps one of the greatest performances in a title fight by any challenger. Cody Garbrandt imbued with an otherworldly essence, was propelled to victory by an impossible dream to claim the belt, and place it in the hands of a cancer survivor, a pact between a man and a young boy, one to become champion and the other to beat a deadly disease, the fulfilment of which transpired on one of the grandest stages on earth. It's one of the most inspiring and beautiful stories the sport will ever know. Dominic Cruz, unfortunately, the byproduct of fate fulfilling dreams. Garbrandt would rub years worth of Dom gloating over his teammates in his rival's face, but that air of undefeated invincibility would soon crumble under the weight of high expectations. Cody would experience what is perhaps one of the harshest career fall offs the sport has come to know. That night he fought Dominic was the day the best fighter the bantamweight division had ever seen, lived and died. From Chael Sonnen's industry-defining promotion to Conor McGregor's elevation of the sport into the zeitgeist, Trash Talk had managed to firmly wedge its place into the fight game. It's now a weapon branded by those looking to make a name for themselves, copying the blueprint of the legends who came before, a pastiche in all its clinical glory. But what happens when the barrel gets aimed close to home? What happens when trash talk changes lives? 
It would be entirely wrong of me to make a video of trash talk going wrong without covering perhaps the most recent vessel of this phenomenon, Colby Covington. His story start to end encapsulates everything I guess this video is trying to say. So let's go back to the start. Covington entered the UFC, an undefeated 5-0, and would continue to mount wins before coming up short against Wally Elvers. Although this setback would prove to just be a minor blip, as he would quickly go on another four-fight winning streak, taking out top calibre competition and proving that he belonged in the rankings, a matchup against number 3 ranked Damian Meyer would be announced, practically guaranteeing that with a win, Colby would be in title contention. But in the background of all of this, the UFC had told Colby that his fighting style and his personality was a dud. He didn't move the needle in any capacity, and the UFC simply wasn't a good fit for him as an athlete. Despite his domination, it seemed that Colby's career in the UFC had run its course, and that the fight with Maya was a swan song. Colby had other plans. After leaving Maya in a pool of his own blood, Covington would turn his attention to the Brazilian home crowd in what is perhaps one of the most infamous octagon interviews of all time. Brazil, you're a dog! All you filthy animals suck! I got one thing to say! Tyrone Woodley, I'm coming for you! If you don't answer the front door, I'm gonna knock you in! And I'm gonna take what's mine! That walked away go! Colby had changed, and whilst we didn't know it at the time, it was according to him for very good reason. Uh, I've never told this story before, but three fights ago, before I fought the number two guy in the world, this guy named Damian Maia in Brazil, they had told my manager, Dan Lambert, that they, were, they weren't going to re-sign me. They didn't like my style. Before this fight, they told me, no matter what happens, I was ranked number six in the world. We're, we're not re-signing you. We don't like your character. We don't like your fighting style. Colby would go from being potentially cut from the organization to getting the opportunity to fight for a world title, all because he had now gone viral. This version of Covington, that deliberate character that he was playing, was here for good, love him or hate him. Chaos would defeat Dos Anjos in a gruelling one-sided decision, but that ascension to claim the throne did not go unaided. His journey was walked side by side by another welterweight. I'm gonna jerk off, I'll be lighter than I can do it. You jerked off twice today. You know how many times you need to jerk off in a day? American top team had brought Colby in for his wrestling prowess, and upon moving to Miami, would strike a friendship with none other than Jorge Masvidal, a man on his own warpath toward the top of the UFC. Colby would end up sleeping on Masvidal's couch, and over the years they would go from unranked competitors to the top of the world, side by side, best friends with one goal in mind. Whilst Colby had successfully trash-talked his way to the top, Jorge was about to show that having a big mouth was a double-edged sword by putting Ben Askren on this list of when trash-talk goes wrong. George, I I think I might have not said this in a language that you understand. Tell the people, are you scared? He doesn't want to fight me because he's scared. Yeah, they need to keep the idiot away from me. I mean, I'm, I'm paid to fight in the octagon. And we can do it for 15 minutes, and I don't want any, any chances that he's going to do something stupid before the fight and ruin it. There is no way in God's green earth this guy could do anything to me. It's totally impossible. I will do whatever I want to this person. I will dominate them. I will humiliate them. You know, he knows, he knows, and I know who's going to win that fight. And he knows he can't come up and sucker punch me if we're in the octagon with the referee. He knows he has to deal with me for 15 minutes. I think he's going to puff his chest out, yell and scream and act like a madman and probably threaten me of some sort. I don't understand where he's trying to go. He's trying to make every excuse why he doesn't have to fight me. You never heard him once say, put me against Askren. He's an easy fight. I'll kick his ass. He didn't say that. Assigned to fight you in a cage, like there's there's a couple rules, but there's not a whole lot of rules, and so how you're yelling and threats, I think it's gonna make it worse for me. I just don't, I can't comprehend that. Yeah, he's an idiot, and I will happily stay away from him. I try to, I'm getting paid to fight him on July 6th. He can punch me all he wants in that 15 minutes, and if he has so little control over his own emotional state, then I'll give him his space. That's fine. Uh, you two there, and I will be full and utter domination by me. How do you beat him? Any way I want. How do you think? I dominate him whole time. Finish him? Possibly. Well, he's good. He's just not good enough. Oh, you can the double leg. His muscles aren't very big and his beard's pretty ugly. But besides that, I think it's going to be total domination. Uh, he doesn't upset me. I'm, I'm happy I'm going to get paid to correct that mistake that has been asked for.
Jorge, with the quickest knockout in UFC history, had now placed himself alongside his friend, Covington, as two men waiting for their shot at the title. What should have been an incredible moment for two friends who were sharing the same impossible dream was instead a turning point for the worse. So I don't know what you make of Colby Covington. He is uh, someone who enjoys being a bit of a, a professional wrestling heel. We want to play some sound for you here that uh, that he delivered, and we want to get the reaction from Jorge Masvidal. This is about you, by the way. Uh, you sent out a tweet towards Jorge Masvidal, which a lot of people thought was, you know, part of the act, a work, etc. You just referred to Masvidal as your ex-best friend. What's the state of your relationship with Jorge Masvidal? All he cares about is himself. That's all Jorge is, 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 a, is a guy that cares for himself. He doesn't care for others, and he doesn't care for anybody unless they can do something for him. And I'm not that guy. I'm not, I'm not gonna always just do stuff for you and then be taken for granted. So, you know, now I passed him up. I'm making more money than him. I'm banging harder chicks than him. I'm doing better in life, and he's just a jealous little <laughs> George, you know, two and two in his last four fights, five and five in his last 10 fights. That, that sounds like a journeyman to me. It hurts that he would do that in a way just for a like on Facebook, you know, just for a retweet on Twitter. He's doing that. It is what it is, man. All these words, you know, they do have consequences to me because this guy used to sleep in my couch. He used to eat off me because I was the ones with the sponsors. He was just still relatively an amateur and I was helping this guy out. So what is going on? Because uh, all of a sudden I'm seeing all these reports that you've been removed from the American Top Team website. Are you no longer affiliated with that team? I'm affiliated with Colby Covington Incorporated as of now. You know, I'm my own team, you know. I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to make money. The fallout would take to the mainstream. If Colby could do anything, it was create a media frenzy, but his attentions would be quickly pulled in another direction, as it was announced that he would be taking on Kamaru Usman in December for the welterweight strap. Colby was granted his biggest platform to date, and was about to catapult himself even further into popularity or infamy. He don't deserve a title shot. Besides Damian Maya, who else? Nobody. And when I asked to fight him, he didn't want to fight me. Keep and using your time to promote me. That's why you're a mark, bitch. Yo, yo you want to talk? You talk Junior, trash settle down, Twitter. Junior. See, we lift. You, you ain't know? ready for prime time yet, son. What is it about Kamaru's game that makes you think you can beat him? He sucks. Where's he good? <laughs> He's not good. Hey, he beat my sloppy seconds after I already beat him. He beat guys that he, were left for dead. Rafael Dos Anjos, Damian Ma. I left them for dead. He came and picked up the scraps after me. He had to come pick up the carcasses off the dead bodies that I left. So, you know, he's not impressive. He sucks at fighting. And December 14th, I'm going to expose him. Really? He's falling in my footsteps. If I make a sandwich tomorrow, he's going to try and make the sandwich the same way. No one wants to hear you talk. They came for me, buddy. Come on, bro. Don't talk, man. No one wants to hear you talk. Every time you talk, you just, a pay-per-view goes shut out. Up, no. Shut no up. No one wants to hear you talk, up, bro. You're boring. Shut no up. No one gives shut a up, about you. Shut up. No one gives a man. Not even your daddy, but don't worry, I'm going to be your daddy on December 14th. You know, you're standing here and you're you're kind of talking now. When did your balls drop? Because they the only thing, thing you're drop. losing faster than your when hairline your is that Power drop? Ranger belt. That big old f***ing head with that 30% hairline still left. I own all the real estate in that head. You think you're It's not too late to pull out, buddy. Cross no one me. cares about you. you're gonna Shut up. Shit Stop talking. Real. Pay per view's going out the window. You couldn't you couldn't draw money with a green crayon and a white piece of paper. You just had the face off with Kamara. What did you say to him up there? I told him what happened to his hairline, you know, that hairline is thirty percent gone, you know, he's only got thirty percent left. And I also told him his mom wanted his bed sheets back. And uh, did he say anything back to you? Nah, he was just smiled, but I could see that he's starting to get nervous. Now he's realizing that on Saturday night he's going to let the whole world down and no one's going to care about him anymore. Marty, we still pull out. It's not too late for you to pull out now. You're already a coward. The world knows you're a coward, so show up, get your ass whooped, embarrass in front of the whole world, back out, be a coward. The end of your time is over now, buddy. And since I'm the king of spoilers, this is what's going to happen tomorrow night. You see Marty fake news, Miss Ugly Smug? I'm going to bounce it off the canvas and I'm going to kick it into the third row and maybe one of you lucky virgins will be able to catch it and take it home with you. The thing is, you don't end up on a when trash talk goes wrong video for no reason. All the years of staying dominantly in the top echelon and using that platform to controversial effect was about to unravel live on pay-per-view.
Kamaru Usman would quite literally break Colby's jaw for talking so much shit. Years worth of horrendous one-liners and mocking his opponents had backfired, much to the delight of many fans and peers. Kamaru had done what so many people had more than likely wanted to do to Covington and sent him reeling into the darkness. Colby would for once stay out of the limelight and the question became, what version of Covington would return? That polite and well-spoken man who had travelled into the top 15? Or that controversial loudmouth that had defined the last few years of the welterweights? Wait till I see you next time, Marty Fake Newsman! You're dead! You're dead! Anyway. Colby and Jorge for the last couple years would take turns losing to Kamaru, either in rematches or short notice fights. It seemed that Colby was certainly the second best welterweight of this modern era, and it was after his second loss that Colby would lower his defences for a short while to bury the hatchet with Usman. Oh, it was perhaps one of the best feel-good moments of the year, a peek behind that thin veneer that over the years had been peeling away from Covington's act. But that rare glimpse into the real Colby would be but a fleeting moment. The losses that both Jorge and Colby had accrued meant one easy choice for the UFC, putting together the biggest grudge match of all time, best friends turned rivals. Backstage pass to what it looks like in fighter rooms. What's up, playboy? What's up, man? I just woke up my buddy, Jorge Masvidal. Can't thank him enough for what he did for me. We just did light sparring the whole game. We sat out a long time ago, over five years ago. We were both broke, plotting on the world of how we were going to make our money and our stake in this world. And our dreams are not falling into plan. If you ask him, so it's whether he gets a title shot first or me, there's no, oh, man, he got the title shot first. That's my little brother. I don't, I don't care. I'm going to be rooting for him. I'll be in his corner probably, you know? UFC Walkerweight Champion. Me and this individual shared a lot of memories, you know? Yeah, um, you guys were real friends. Train, tra at some point, I would have considered us real friends. If you would sell out our friendship like that so quick, we never had a friendship. You know, it was all fake. I thought we had a friendship, hmm. but I could see from your end to mine, we were never cool, man. You were just using me or whatever the hell, you know, sleeping on my couch. I, You know, we lived together, but it was, it was a one-way street. He was just using me for his training camps to help him with wrestling. You know, he didn't have a good wrestler to, to help him prepare for his fights. You guys, at one time, you were cool, right? We, we were until he ripped off my coach, and since then I ain't talked to him. Because and... once I got the UFC title against Rafael Dos Nachos, you know, he, didn't, he was jealous and, and bitter, and, you know, money and fame got to him, and now he wanted to turn his back on me, so. Didn't, didn't pay him money. My coach was training him since he's an amateur all the way till he got his title with RDA, and then after that just ripped him off. When that happened, he died to me, you know. What next for Kobe Covington? Everybody knows who's next, you know. It's, it's got to be journey, journeyman George Masvidal, a.k.a. Street Judas. Y'all used to be boys. You used to be roommates. What the hell has happened? What's going on? Then my coach coached him his whole career. Then when he had the chance to finally pay back the 12500 he didn't. So I went out there and paid my coach out of my own pocket. So since then, it was already like, I'm going to you up at some point. He's a nobody. He's a criminal. I'm going to expose him next weekend if he shows up. Hey, you you bro. You're a lying ass yeah, that's right. Right foot. Right foot. This guy won his next Big 45 sniffer. fights in a row. He still Big wouldn't sniffer. have a better winning percentage than me. Any way to deal with a bitch like that, you got to end his ass, bro. I'm sending him back to the casinos, sending him back to the gaming halls, you know. Such a fucking bomb is going to be easy work. Dude. This ain't even going to be a, a walk in the park. Dude. Socialist yeah, little fucking you thought little Obama phone and food stamps. You still sleeping from your last oh, up, sniffer. You're a bum. Shut up, boy. Um, journeyman. Florida, I live in Hialeah. I'm in Dade County, bitch. I run this motherfucking city. I'm the king of Miami, bitch. This dude's not allowed in my city, Miami, ever again. If I see him, he's getting sparked on sight, dropped on his head. The only difference is Saturday night, he's gonna have the UFC to pay his medical bills. You know, Street Judas Masvidal, they wanted to make this big hype fight of best friends turned rival. We hate each other, hate each other's guts now. He was running his mouth in the media saying all oh, this and that I'll, I'll, I'll drop Kobe on site that guy's fragile blah blah I'm here with the winner Kobe Coven Covington first of all Kobe congratulations on a dominant and impressive performance all the years that you sparred together did you ever anticipate that you were gonna fight him I just took care of Miami street trash now it's time to take care of Louisiana swap trash where you at Justin Poirier you you said it's on site the wheel never stops turning, the clock never ceases to tick. And so you might be wondering, 
Why does Colby remain on this list after dominating his former friend? Well, although he won the fight, I doubt he gained much else beyond it. Some words simply can never be taken back. We have a story just sent to us. UFC fighter Jorge Masvidal is now in the Miami-Dade County Jail. He's charged with aggravated battery with great bodily harm and criminal mischief. Masvidal is accused of attacking fellow fighter Colby Covington outside a South Beach restaurant Monday night. Masvidal took off, but his lawyer called Miami Beach police and Masvidal turned himself in. He'll have to go to bond court in the morning. Mentorships and friendships were raised to ash and dust in the pursuit of financial gain. And who are we to know if it was the right or wrong decision? What Jorge and Colby had, money could not afford. A friendship that elevated both of them higher and higher. But it was ultimately dollars that had separated them. Covington had become one of the most well-known athletes on the roster due to his newfound persona. Jorge, on the other hand, had found similar amounts of fame, but from staying true to who he was as an individual. It's a tale of two opposites. One had sold their soul, whilst the other gritted it out through all the ups and downs of a back and forth career, only finding success after a transcendental experience on a reality TV show. Whilst most tuned in for the entertainment factor of friends turned rivals, the seeing both Covington and Jorge stand across from each other after years of friendship was kind of just depressing. And I often wonder, as I'm sure Colby does late at night, if it was all worth it. The reason that I wanted to make this video is that despite wanting to deny my more casual self, I could admit that some of the greatest moments of this sport for me have been the direct result of trash talk. And whilst the purist of this sport might try and convince you that it simply ruins the game and that what we should appreciate is the finer moments of precise combat inside of the cage. I would argue that we can have our cake and eat it too in this situation. There is already a lot on the line for these athletes. 50% of their pay, progress up the rankings, a belt, pay-per-view points, prestige and legacy. All of the above are worthy enough in their own right to make a fan tune in. Trash Talk puts something else on the line entirely though, and it's hard to exactly pinpoint what that is. For some, it's to see arrogance to be humbled, or their favourite fighter to live up to the words of violence, or perhaps it is to see a man that they heavily dislike pay for their expression. Whatever it is, when words cross a certain line, it piques our interests. With high risk comes high reward. Ask Covington, who not only managed to keep himself employed, but then became a fan favourite for half the sports audience and made the other half completely despise him. Both parties consuming any pay-per-view of his for very different reasons. But a buy is a buy, and I'm sure Dana White doesn't care if you are there to watch a man lose or watch a man win. The sport nestled its place into my heart through videos that inspired the very one that you're watching now. Complations of when trash talk goes wrong made by War MMA, or montages of the best pre-fight build-ups made by Lerone. Links in the description by the way. Those were the videos, those were the moments that captured my attention. McGregor had paved a way to stardom through the vicious words that he would spout in the lead up to his multi-million pay-per-view sales. His riches serve as a war banner to guide the younger generation of fighters to the same wealth and fame through the weaponization of the microphone, he created many pastiches of himself, their faint little screeches on the main stage, muffled echoes of a man who had catapulted the sport into the mainstream. But the problem is, those verbal attacks, certainly in the case of Alexander Hernandez and Joanna Janjacek, are often uncharacteristic, out of place, clinical infomercials for a personality that isn't exactly real. Alexander didn't say a peep in his career previously, and has quite interestingly not been as vocal since after being deported to the Shadow Realm. Now you might say that Cerrone had taught him a valuable lesson, but I'd suggest that perhaps Alexander saw an opportunity and stole a blueprint that he thought would build a fan base. The fact is, it didn't. And finally, there are those on the other side of the shit talk, those under the crosshairs. A UFC 229, Khabib would set McGregor on his back in round two and proceed to maul him for four minutes straight. All the while, in a flurry of thudding hammer fists, Khabib would say, let's talk now. Atypically, McGregor didn't have very much to say. Well, that was until the end of round three. He would lean close to his opponent that he had verbally attacked for months with racism, threats, attacks on religion and family. And then he would state, it's only business. Just a gentle reminder that you can double your deposit up to $100 with Underdog Fantasy using code ACADEMIC and the link in the description, which directly supports the channel and makes videos like this possible. Thanks so much guys for an awesome year, and I'll see you all next time.